A sea of cataract surgery, customize, control, and confidence. Sir, thank you, Dr. Elan. My topic for today. Uh, please change the slides. Yeah. My topic for today is defining the three C's of cataract surgery: customize, control, and confidence. Now, the first question we come to is why customize? Well, like we all know, one side does one size doesn't fit all. The customization is the key to patient satisfaction. It differentiates practices from one another, and it helps us to understand the individual's visual needs and demands. Now, there is a myth amongst quite a few people that customization is only possible with state-of-art instruments. Well, this is definitely not true, because customization involves understanding the patient's lifestyle. It also involves understanding the patient's work environment and nature of work, understanding his motivation to go glass-free. operating on the steep axis like dr anurag just mentioned to reduce the astigmatism doing lris where required to again get get the astigmatism down without using any of the expensive equipments and choosing the right iol for the right patient and the most important working within the financial limits of the patients and of the practice technology however does have a role to play in customization and like dr anurag mentioned the varion is a very good example which we've been using over the past few years which has the reference unit which measures the corneal astigmatism power and the k readings and uh, gives us a high uh, uh, takes a high uh, a high resolution digital image which captures the scleral vessels limbus and the iris image which is then used as a fingerprint for uh, giving you the overlay during surgery the planning station not only gives you i think i'll skip this uh, slide because dr anurag has covered this in detail and the uh, the actual digital marker which helps us to choose the uh, whether the lens is uh, the ccc and the lens can be centered on the pupil the visual axis or the limbus the next important point in customize customization is choosing the right iol for the right eye and this is especially true for a post refractive surgery with the amount of people who underwent lasik in the past 20 25 years now coming to the cataractus age group the most important challenge over here for us is the right iol power calculation in these patients now what happens in post lasik in a myopic lasik there is a central flattening and as we all know in hyperopic lasik we have a central steepening which results in an altered anterior posterior corneal curvature now this gives rise to a formula error because most of the formula considers the relationship between the corneal power and the anterior chamber depth to predict the effective lens position so what happens in myopic lasik in myopic lasik it predicts a shallow anterior chamber depth and an anterior elp and thereby it underestimates the iol power giving rise to an hyperopic surprise on the contrary in a hyperopic lasik it predicts a deeper anterior chamber depth a posterior elp an over estimation of iol power and therefore a myopic surprise so what do we do we need to choose the right formula for all these problems like was mentioned by the previous speakers one of the best formula to use is the uh, doctor the uh, barrett's formula from the apcrs website or the ascrs website gives you the uh, warren hill uh, wonkok uh, formula and it gives you an analysis of the various formulae so that one can then choose and also gives us an average of the different formulae the next point here would be the, to use the right iol now here one needs to use their demons to the advantage looking at the zernike case polynomials is very very important especially in cases of post refractive surgery like we all know a target zero spherical aberration it helps to improve the visual quality now what to understand the basics the cornea is normally prolate with a q value of minus 0.26 what happens in a myopic lasik is that there the cornea becomes oblate and the q value becomes positive and therefore in these cases one should always implant a lens with a negative spherical aberration practically this would be something like an amo technis or an alcon iq on the contrary in a hyperopic lasik we are making the cornea more prolate the q value becomes more negative and therefore one should choose a lens with a positive spherical aberration uh, and this would translate into either a bnl softlex or an alcon sa6080 on the other hand in a post rk or in decentered ablations in these cases one should choose a lens with a zero spherical aberration practically this would be an uh, amo sensar or a, a bosch and lomacrius 
So these are some of the commercially available lenses with their aspherosity and in which cases you can use which ones. In cases of a decentered or weak zonules where you're not sure of the centering of the IOL, it's best to use a lens with a zero spherical, with a zero aspherosity. Now, whether one should do a multifocal IOL post refractive surgery, well, the data literature states that one can use multifocal IOLs and get very good results. However, certain important points had to be noted that even in this case with a perfect topography, when you look at the Zernike's polynomials and you see the higher order aberrations here, the higher order aberrations here is about 0 0.991 and therefore this is not a good case for a multifocal IOL. In cases of, in cases of, uh, in the, another slide over here you can see that here the higher order aberrations are only 0 0.332 and therefore this would be an ideal case for using a multifocal IOL. Sorry, not such a joke. Another thing is the, imp the importance of angle kappa and the angle alpha on the visual quality following a multifocal IOL. Literature has proved that this is very important. So basically angle alpha is the angular distance between the optical axis and the visual axis. And any angle alpha more than 0 0.5 is not a favorable case for a multifocal IOL. The second C of con uh, is the control, which means the patient control, parameter control, procedure control, or the logistic control. Patient control is putting the patient at ease and assessing the needing, need for a block or in cases of uncooperative patients. The parameter control is matching the parameters to individual style, whether you're doing a direct uh, uh, divide and conquer, a stop and chop, or a direct chop, and matching the parameters to a particular case. For example, in a posterior polar cataract, you'd use a slow motion FACO. In a hard cataract, you'd probably use a high vacuum continuous power. And in cases of weaker zonules, you use a low IOP or a low flow into the eye. The procedure control here would involve a proper control. Now, for example, here, you're doing a rexis. It's a routine case otherwise. And as you're continuing with your rexis over here, you suddenly find that the rexis is running away. Now, this is important to control it at this stage and probably use a Brian Little technique over here. There, the, if, the identification is important. Use the uh, Brian Little technique with good control, getting the rexis back into the center. This is another one case where again in a in a white mature cataract, we find again the rexis is run away. So again, you pull the rexis back towards the center. And you are able to then, with proper control, get a perfect rexis. The case of a uh, hypermature cataract, and how, do, how does one pro pre uh, prevent an Argentinian flag sign? You do a small anterior capsular puncture, puncture here. After having pressurized the uh, anterior chamber with viscoelastic, do not void the anterior liquid cortex. You make a small rexis initially, and then use a bimanual aspiration irrigation to rock the nucleus so that the posterior cortic cortex is voided out. And then you can enlarge the rexis to a larger size. So, so this is where the control comes in. Logistic control here involves choosing the right patient, seeing that you do not put in the wrong IOL and controlling of sterility. And the, th the last C is the concept of having confidence. And this comes from control, learning from the masters, and gaining experience. So this is a particular small video I would like to show. This is a subluxated lens with a case of Marfans. You start off by initiating a tear, supporting the nucleus with a duckbill uh, instrument and then completing the rexis. This rexis is obviously not centered on the pupil because it's decentered. We now have put in two capsular hooks. I'm just fast forwarding because of paucity of time. And being a soft cataract, this can be removed with only an aspiration irrigation.
This is then followed by putting in a ring segment which can be sutured to sclera. And in spite of having a difficult case, one can have a perfect outcome. I think I'll skip the remaining uh, one more video if I can show. Dr. Okay, sir. First one. So this is just uh, to show the control to manage complications. So this is a routine case. Everything is going on very smoothly. And suddenly you find that there is a posterior chamber rent with a large piece of nucleus inside. So it's very important to understand here that one cannot come out of the eye without covering the uh, rent with a good viscoelastic. Once you put in a good viscoelastic and cover the rent, we can still go in and continue the phaco emulsification. So in short, what I would want to say that good confidence would come with good control and learning from the masters. One should be willing to uh, even get your videos audited from seniors so that you can understand uh, what flaws you're making in your normal surgery. Thank you and sorry for having exceeded the time. Thank you, sir.